Anyway, before we take refuge tonight, it was another question that was asked to me. What is the difference between Buddhism and, say, Hinduism? Because the practices are very similar. They have teachers, we, we have teachers. They have their tradition, we have our tradition, and um, so forth. Or what is the difference between Tibetan Buddhism and, say, um, the Sufi tradition of the Arabs, Arab tribes? or the American Indian tradition of North America, or the Hawaiian tradition of these islands. What, what, is, this, what is this Tibetans? And what it is is a carryover from the Buddha Shakyamuni, who introduced all of this 2,600 years ago, to the present day transmission. There's a transmission of mind to mind things that work, called Dharma a system of methods and practices. But the very basis of all this is called altruism. And that lets out all the other traditions. There's no altruism in any other tradition on the planet, spiritual, religious, or otherwise. So what does this word altruism mean? Is mean and we state this at the start of our practice. In fact, I'll read it from the refuge. We do these practices in order to attain enlightenment for ourselves and limitless sentient beings, our mother. So we now all together take refuge. Now that term means that you are doing these practices for the benefit of all the beings in the entire universe. Well, that comes back to the understanding that your mind is producing the universe. If your mind is producing the universe, then you're producing the beings in the universe, in which you have interaction and connection. So impartially applied compassion means, for instance, in India, they, they, they really like the cow, but they don't like dog. <laughs> so in India, you can't kill a cow, but eat the dog. So we have compassion for the cows, screw the dog. <laughs> See, that's not very impartial, that's not very altruistic. Or my God's better than your God, so we're going to go to war over it. That's not very altruistic. Altruism means from the heart. You're concerned about the welfare of every living being in this whole universe as if they were your mother. And they were in past lives. That's how many past lives they had. Can't count how many animals on this planet. But all those animals are one time in one. <laughs> this is the way that we present this program to Tibetan Buddha. And just that one thought, if you really ponder it, clears the idea of separation between you and everybody in the environment. Now we're going to carry this thought a little bit further with what is called prayers of aspiration. And somebody asked about prayer. And I have a text in front of me that Kala Rinpoche calls a guru yoga practice called the Reign of Blessing. And in this text, it has a section called the Aspirations to Attain the State of Mahamudra, which means to know your inner mind to know the mind of clarity and apply it. Not just know it, but with the Lama's help and so forth, apply it to your relationships and everything. So this <clears throat> prayer is called the Aspiration Prayer of Mahamudra, which is called the Definitive Meaning of the State of Clarity. And this was done by um, the Karmapa, my teeth, the last karma, the Rangu Georgi was his name. So here I'm going to read it. And as I present this, I'm going to have, give a little explanation. It says, homage to the Guru as the Lama, the Lamas, Yidams, and deities of the mandala of the Sutra and Tantra tradition. Buddha of the three times, that means the past, present, and future. 
and the ten directions, which means filling space, and their offspring. Look upon me with loving kindness and grant your blessing that my prayers may be accomplished exactly as I ask them. Now that doesn't mean they're going to fulfill your prayers. That means they're going to give you the support for you to fulfill your prayer. And fulfill them in such a way that's appropriate. Appropriate to what? To you and everybody else. Okay? Not just you, not just your idea of what you want. Because what you want, the way we think, might not be appropriate. Like, you know, kids want a lot of things, and there's a lot of things you can't give kids because it would be harmful to them. Humans are very much all, we're all children. <laughs> so we got to be careful. So all prayers and wishes be accomplished exactly as I ask. May this river of virtue of the threefold purity the threefold purity is the purity of the mind, the purity of the body's activities, and the purity of what you say. Comes from the Tibetan tradition of pure action and myself. Innumerable sentient beings, which are united in this ocean, are to accomplish the four bodies of the Buddha, which is their innate nature. Now the four bodies of the Buddha are called Buddha vehicles to to benefit other beings, benefit the environment. The four vehicles is the body of speech, the body of thought, and the body of action, and then all three of those together with the same connection to clarity, the inner lama is called clarity. The outer lama is only to help you get to the clarity. Okay. You have to do it. Until this is accomplished, may I in this lifetime and throughout all my successions of birth in the future, enjoy the goodness of an ocean of happiness and virtuous activity. And may there never be the sound or, of torment, pain, or suffering. Having obtained this precious human body in this life, free and well endowed, having faith, energy, and intelligence, and having it attended upon a worthy spiritual friend, my Lama, may I practice this Dharma properly as I've received it in this and all my lives in the future without interruption. Studying the text develops the intellect. It also helps one to overcome doubt. May I be free from obscuration of ignorance and complete the oral instructions of my Lama in order to become a mature human being. By the light of meditation, may the natural state of consciousness shine forth just as it is. May the light of this bring what is called threefold knowledge, the knowledge of how to use your mind, the knowledge of how to speak, and the knowledge of how to act. From the meaning of the base of the ground, two truths arise. One is the relative truth, which is how we are, and the other is the ultimate truth, which we possess in, intrinsically. That's, what we, that's where we're going. <clears throat> These two truths are free of the limits of the extreme views. The supreme path of the two accumulations of practice which cause merit are only for myself and others. In this way we are all inseparable and free of the extremes of praise and blame. Attaining the fruit of the two benefits for myself and others, this freedom of the extremes of becoming and tranquility are not necessary. In this way, may I meet the unerring Dharma. The ground of purification is the mind itself. It's inseparable from voidness. The means of the purification is the great Vajra Yoga of Mahamudra. Mahamudra means to have the connection to your own innate state of clarity. And the word clear simply means clear of emotionality. I, I shouldn't say simple. It is simply that. 
The object of purification is the transitory stain of confusion. May I truly realize the fruit of purification, which is called the pristine dharmakaya, which is like the sky. It means your, your clear nature doesn't have any limit. So when you connect to that, you got to be ready for no limit. <laughs> now you can do anything. Anything's possible. So again, if you make prayers and like I'm doing here, aspirations, you want to be really careful about it because now you have the power of the all-pervasive nature, which is equal to the power of the universe. And so there's no such thing as a supreme being or a God in this tradition anyway. Um, you're it. <laughs> You're, you're, you're assuming the role of responsibility for this phenomenal world and everybody in it, just like a mother does for her kids. Resolving doubts brings conviction in this view. Maintaining this without wavering is the key point of any meditation practice. Training skillfully in all points of meditation is called the supreme activity. May I be confident in the view, my meditation, and action. All dharmas are projections of the mind. Dharma means things. In the mind, there's no mind because the mind's nature is basically empty. Though it, it's empty, it can manifest in any way without ceasing. Investigating this well, may I discern this root basis. Spontaneous appearance, which has never been, we mistake for an object. Through the ignorance, this spontaneous awareness is confused with the object as a self. Since a self cannot be found, this causes what is confusion. Under the influence of this duality, we wander in this world of becoming, complete with pain and suffering. So may I cut off the ignorance of confusion at the root. Since it does not exist, we're speaking of the mind, Buddhists can't find it. But since it does not, not exist, because it is the basis of all the suffering in samsara, and the peace of nirvana. There being no contradiction between these two situations is the unity called the middle way. In practice, this is the most beneficial place. May I realize this dharmata of boundless mind and always remain in the middle. If one says it is this, there's no reference. If one says this is not it, there's no ground for denial. May I personally gain conviction in the perfect ultimate truth of the unconditioned state called dharmata, which transcends the necessity for knowledge or intellect. Not realizing this, we circle in this ocean of samsara. Samsara means emotionality. Realizing it, a Buddha is not other. There being no is or is not, may I come aware of the vital point of the all ground, which is the nature of the nature of the universe. Since appearance is mind and emptiness is also mind, since one can realize the mind and realize that the confusion is also in the mind, and since arising is mind and cessation is mind, with all of this may I cut through all doubts concerning the mind. Without spoiling meditation by intellectual approaches and effort, and unmoved by the winds of emotional worldly drama, and being able to settle in an uncontrived natural state, may I maintain skilled practice, which is the essence of the mind. Calming the waves of coarse thoughts on their own ground, a river of unwavering mind comes naturally to rest. Free from contamination of dullness and conceptualization, may I establish this unmoving ocean of samatha, which means peace, by looking again and again in the mind which can't be seen. 
In this state of clarity, vividly, the meaning of not seeing arises exactly as it is. Cutting all doubts about existence and non-existence, may I unmistakably know my own essence. Looking at objects, the mind devoid of objects is seen. Looking directly at the mind, its devoid nature of mind arises as emptiness. Looking at both of these, dualistic fixation is self-liberated by this view. Dualistic fixation means you believe the subject, you, and the objects are separate. That's called dualistic fixation. That's the human race. And the animals too. They're, they have to they have to have their approach to what we call instinct. So they have instinctual awareness. They can't change. But humans have the ability to change. Leopard can't change. Human can change. <laughs> now I realize this natural state of luminous mind is freedom itself. And this freedom produces a, a mental production we label Mahamudra. Free from this extreme is the middle way. Being the embodiment of everything in the universe, it is called Dzogchen, the mind of bliss. May I attain confidence that knowing one, all are realized. Great bliss is simply an unceasing removal of attachment and allowing the luminosity unobscured to arise without any fixation or attachment. When entering into a state of non-thought, one transcends the intellect. In this way, you are spontaneously in the present. May I experience this continuously without effort, through practice. May clinging to the desire for good be self-liberated, and the nature of negative thoughts and confusion, all purified into what is called space. Now, space is boundless, so it will hold a lot of Stop. So the nature of beings is always like a Buddha, enlightened. Not realizing this, or ordinary beings wander in endless emotionality. For these sentient beings who suffer without limit, may overwhelming compassion be conceived in my being. Although such compassion is skillful, may the truth of its essential <coughs> emptiness be nakedly clear. In this way, a unity becomes the supreme unerring path. May I meditate on it separately both day and night, and may I acquire the eyes of super perception that arise through the power of this meditative absorption. May I ripen sentient beings and purify Buddha fields. This is a Buddha field, so obviously it needs purifying. May I perfect the aspiration that accomplishes all of the Buddha's Dharma's prayers and wishes. Arising at the end of perfecting, meditating, and purifying, may there be maturity as a human being. This is what we call Buddhahood. By the power of the compassion of all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and all of their children, and by the power of whatever virtue or good activity exists, May the pure aspirations of this prayer for myself and all sentient beings be fulfilled exactly as it is stated. That's called an aspiration. <laughs> so if you ask what you're doing as a, as a Buddhist. Can I ask a question? Yeah. In the prayer, you at one point said there is no mind. That's right. There, but there is. No, you can't find it. No Buddha. But there are scientists who study the brain. Oh, no, scientists are, are worldly. Are what? Worldly. Worldly? Yeah, they're what we call the third person view. Mm -hmm. If you take the first person view, which is you, mm -hmm. and try to find your mind, you won't find it. The third person view can make up anything they want. <laughs> you get me? So scientists do that. <laughs> so the, and none of their none of their so-called uh, scientific experiments can work without an observer. The observer is the scientist himself or herself. 
That's what we call third person view. So you have the you have the experiment, the effect, and the observer of the experiment and the effect. Because the observer is an idiot human being, okay, has no sense beyond the worldly. That's what we call an idiot human being. They're extremely smart. Okay? But they don't know the nature of everything. It's nothing whatsoever. That's why they can never find an end to the experiment of going smaller and smaller and smaller through particles or larger and larger and larger with your telescopes through space because there's no end to that. That, and, and their scientific limits, they, they will never find the true nature of everything is nothing whatsoever. Space itself. But when you go as first person into your mind, you can't find yourself. All you'll find is an idea of the self. But you'll never find an entity called a soul or existing being. Not possible. That's why if you if you stay in the present and refine the present, after a while you experience a state of no time. Because time is another concept of the human idiot mind. You know I mean? Time nature doesn't have a time program. See? Nature doesn't do that. It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have a middle, and it doesn't have an end. Your your mind is the same way, but you can't find the mind. And that's good, because that state of voidness is exactly the state of no emotionality. And you can realize that, you can relax in that, you can say, wow, I got no program today to drive me up the wall. So I don't need another program to drive me back down the wall. You become the wall. You just relax. It's exactly like what's in front of your eyes. You can, you can point to right here. This is exactly the true nature of your mind. If that's true, then this nature and the nature of your mind are the same thing. If that's true, then your mind is the nature of the entire universe. And everybody in it. That's why we take refuge as all sentient beings as our mother. And partially applied compassion to the worst human, worst animal, worst spirit in the existence. Because obviously they just need a little healing, they just need some help. And if they're once your mother, you want to help them. But don't they need to want help? Oh, no. No? If somebody's psychotic, what are they going to want? <laughs> <laughs> now, we're just new right. But we, may, we, may, we're they, just new rock. They may want to be psychotic. They don't, they don't want you interfering with their mind. They like being psychotic. Yeah, they, yeah, they believe that's the way it should be. Yeah. But there's other beings around them that are not so tickled, so then, tickled about as, it. I'm just curious as to what should they do. Well, here, I run into psychotic. I run into psychotics all the time because the Dharma attracts psychotic individuals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It magnetizes. And I just have to tell them. When you say the Dharma, what do you I just have to tell them. I have great compassion for you and I love you. But you need professional help. <laughs> and it's right down the street, Mahalona Hospital. So go down there and see Nurse Jones down the street. Next lifetime, maybe I can help you. This lifetime, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so, so uh, to refer is 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 an is an okay Buddhist position. To what? To refer. Oh, so we have to. You have to. Oh yeah. Sometimes. Otherwise, they just take up all our time. That's true. Yeah, it's like going from Skype to Zoom. We we replaced Skype, which was a pretty good working program, but limited. So then we put in Zoom. Well, all the limits that Skype had disappeared when we put the program Zoom in. In fact, there were so many new benefits that we were just amazed. Well, that's exactly the Dharma. If you practice Dharma, you wonder, why didn't these things start to be ha happen before? 
Because you didn't put the cause into motion. Cause? Yes. You didn't cause this new state of happiness and good health to arrive, which is what the Dharma does. Mm -hmm. I've been practicing 1977. Yesterday I go to the gym. After all these years, I go to a gym. There's a gym right there. My trainer is Abby, because she, she works out. So I go through the gym, what, hour, hour and 15 minutes? The first time is like, <laughs> So she's running me through all these machines. Right? Right. Amazing. Then she asked me today, you, did you feel anything from all the work I had done? No. Why is it supposed to be? Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you feel better. I, I, I'm a lot stronger. I feel stronger in my body. Yeah. Well, I, I want to. I mean, I can um, show you the results of work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have to make a fit. <laughs> As I went to work out, did that. I went to Kauai, um, Kapa'a Neighborhood Center, and they have. Um, the uh, weight room. Oh yeah. And uh, it's fun, huh? Yeah. yeah so. You come out of there, you feel Well, Dharma practice does the same thing for the mental. Mental, yeah. Unless, like, some people are inclined to do prostrations, which is like hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. Yoga is a mental approach to good health, mm -hmm. like the gym. Yeah, I've been trying doing the prostration. I'm telling you, it's a challenge. <laughs> Gets good I mean, results, I'm, not, too. I'm, I'm getting, and I made that sock with the hole in it. Was oh, you did? Yes, I'm, I'm getting better, but um, if I did it, you would not notice. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while to get going on those. Yeah, but how's your mind after that? Uh, good. Okay, I can give you an added benefit. Okay. Tonight after class, I'll give you a picture of what is called the refuge tree. Refuge? Refuge tree. We take refuge. Uh -huh. This is a really weird thing. The Buddhists take refuge. Even the Buddha took refuge. He, he stopped practicing Hindu and went under a tree and started practicing. Become a mature human being. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. But it's called refuge. Uh -huh. Well, when you take refuge, that means you some kind of protection against something that's not healthy, usually. Mm -hmm. So we start with refuge. Mm -hmm. But what is the refuge? Is a support, an outer support of mm -hmm. all of the establishment of the ideas of the Buddha, as presented 2,600 years ago, passed down through the human race to the present day. Because humans are just as screwed up today as they were 2,600 years ago. But the problem is we have 7 billion of them. Screwed up humans. <laughs> and I'm one of them. <laughs> anyway, so the refuge is to pick, connect to an outer support that can keep you from the from the normal emotional tendencies that cause so much so much sickness. So when you take refuge, my first prostrations were to my Lama, this Lama. Why was I making prostrations to him? Because he was making prostrations to me, the group of 50 people. He was demonstrating. He didn't say this is part of the practice. He said, this is prostrations and this is what we do when we take refuge. You've got that much. So the refuge means protection, support. Oh, that's good. That's, that's, I like that about yeah, like you know what's going on here, but you don't know what's going on behind you. So the refuge has your back. Oh, that's you got to take care of the front. <laughs> but the, the back is the spirit world. You don't know what's going on so you know, inside and around you with these entities. You don't know what the people down the street are doing. See? You don't know what the animals are doing. So you need support. You need refuge. What? Yeah. Protection. Yeah. Then it's, it's a health program. And that way you get more mentally alert, more physically healthy. 
and you're, it affects your speech. You're, you're nice up here, and your body's okay, strong. You can talk nice. You can talk, give good advice, and so forth, like a mother does with a kid. But the real way to take refuge is to put this thing in front of you. This is a tree. This is a symbol of a tree. And it's a very, very powerful symbol because if you understand what it is, it's coming up out of the ocean of emotionality, which is all of us. And it's shooting up into the sky, and here's all these thousands and thousands of men and women that know all these tricks, and I'm one of them. <laughs> I know tricks, that's all. See, mom is no trick. So you put those in the branches of the tree like crows. Just fill the branches with the water. Then on the lower branches, you put all the particular practices called sutra and tantra. That's called the bodhisattvas. And over here you put all the Buddhas. Those are all the mature beings. Why? Because these characters never go away. As long as there's human life on this planet, these beings will be here. Why? Because they never rebirth as an animal. They never rebirth as a, a spirit. They only come back into the human world when it's appropriate as a human being. And they don't have karma. Ooh. See, they don't have karma. That's my word for enlightenment. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Yeah. So that's what you're taking refuge in. So this is, oh, and then around the base of the tree are the actual protectors. Now, you can get to your point in practice where when you pray, somebody asked me about prayer, or you have an aspiration to become or do something, you get out of the way and let your innate nature, the power of your own consciousness, do it for you. <laughs> That's called the protector. So they ring the bottom of the tree. And what they are is they're protecting this influence from this emotional influence of us. The beings in the world who are so emotional. Which is all the animals, all the humans, and all the spirits. But right down here at the base is your llama taking refuge with you. So around the tree are you and all your mother's family's friends around there. This is the lake of emotionality. And you're all doing prostrations to this tree. Now, I used to take this picture to the beach till I got it memorized. And a prostration board, very slick piece of tile board. And two socks. I cut holes in the socks. And then I had my shirt board on one end. In this picture of my <laughs> refuge board, and I go find a shady spot at the beach, I crank out my prostration. Then I go surfing. And when I went out surfing, this kind of thing kind of followed me around. And I'm trying to keep my mind on, you know, nature, the element, the waves, and so forth. Because life's threatening out. But I found that I got to be better and better at surfing. To the point where I gave it up. Because the ego wants to say, oh, bigger way, bigger way, bigger way. <laughs> See? And that's what this is really protecting you from, your own ego century. I. See, I never gets enough. More is always better. That's the I. The I doesn't exist. It isn't an I thing. You cannot exist separate from everybody else. If you try, you're going to die. Because everything you have, somebody else has made for you. Food, clothing, everything. But we have goals, personal goals. Oh, I just read them. That's what aspirations are. So you can... Yeah, that's my goals. I just saw... So that's your eye. Four pages, five pages of gold. But that's your eye. No, there's no eye. It says we. The reason I'm doing this is me, <laughs> we. All says you me. I God. But I cannot I cannot do it for you. No, that's true. You can't. And I can't do it for you either. So that so comes down to now it. you're talking about practice. That means you have to do it. That's right. Well, you are doing it. <laughs> Your first prostration was for you. 
Everyone you do from then on is for everybody else. Oh, I see. That first one saved you. <laughs> really. Because you did it just by here, you know, Mama Tati says you brought attention to me. So I'll find out. <laughs> Your curiosity, enthusiasm will start to come into it. Because you'll see better and better results in your own situation. I did. I was 35 years old when I started doing this stuff. So now I'm 78. Same person. I didn't change body. But this is not the body I had 35 years ago. 43 years ago. Is it? Every cell in this body has been replaced. Every atom has been replaced. But you're on the right track. Your questions are show that you have innate wisdom curiosity. Yes. And you'll be chewing on this like a dog chews on the bone. Yeah, I do. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's your intelligence. I, I'm in the middle of that book right now, I'm really enjoying it. And uh, he talks about being able to control his body heat in the middle of winter so that steam rose from his head. And, um, Here we have tricks. And, and then he passed the master, the taskmaster, and smiled like he was so proud that he was able to do it. You know? and then, Years later, he feels embarrassed and regrets to have so much pride. And I'm thinking, yeah, it, 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 he did good. <laughs> I mean, he, he did something he didn't, he didn't think was possible, and he did it. Anybody can do it. But All you have to do is hold your breath. Hold your breath. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you can Liar can hold her breath up to almost four minutes. Who? Liar, my daughter. Uh -huh. Well, you can't do it all at once. No, but all you have to do is hold your breath. That's that's the trick. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. that's interesting because I wondered how it was done. No, because when you hold your breath, the energy's down here. Down here is your boiling pot. This is where everything is fermented, kind of. Mm -hmm. A lot of heat created right here in your body. Mm -hmm. okay. Very close to the heart energy, so everything working here. It's your power center, they call it. So this energy center, your air is going, and if you push it down into this center, it starts to heat up. And the longer you hold your breath, the hotter it will get. That's it. How do you think Sir Sherpas can go to the top of Mount Everest without any oxygen? Everybody else? 20,000 feet, they're dying because they don't have oxygen. Sherpa is right to the top, 200 pound load, no problem. Because they know how to hold their breath. Mm -hmm. The Lama showed them a trick. The Lama trick. Mm -hmm. But the Hindus do the same thing, it's called Kundali. Kundalini, they call it Kundalini. I call it Kundalini. Yeah. Anybody. You think you need to breathe instead of holding your breath? No, you don't. Why? Because it takes a lot of... Well, okay, yes, you're right. One llama takes an inhale at 6 o'clock in the morning. Exhales at noon. <laughs> and re-inhales at 6 in the evening. Why do you laugh? It's a trick. Because, you know, when you do, when you do exercise, they say, breathe in, breathe out. Oh, that's hot the yoga. That's right. What? That's right, that's hot the yoga. Well, even, even we're talking about heat. Even oh, I see. But even when we, we meditate, you know, we breathe, breathe in the light, breathe out. Yeah, so you can focus. Light. Yeah. And um, but good one. Anyway, but I know thousands of tricks. Thousands of thousands. Tricks. But am I going to practice all those? I don't have time for that. This is a trick. This book is full of tricks. Now, the main trick in Tibetan Buddhism is this trick. What we're going to do it's called refuge. This distinguishes us from any other so called spiritual tradition. Religion, we're not religion. This is spiritual. 
In order to attain enlightenment for ourselves and limitless sentient beings, our mothers, we now all together take refuge and offer prostrations. We go for refuge to all the glorious holy ones. We go for refuge to all the idams who are the deeds gathered in our mandala. We go for refuge to all the Buddhas, those who have conquered the mind and gone beyond. We go for refuge to all the Supreme Dharma. We go for refuge to all the Noble Sangha. We go for refuge to all Dakas and Dakinis who are the protectors and defenders of the Dharma. All of these possess the eye of transcending awareness. And we do this in Sanskrit. And the last phrase of the Sanskrit is Nam la chab suchyo, which simply means we all together do this. All in Mama, Namma, Namma, And with this refuge, which is the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and the three roots of Tantra, which is the Lama, the deities, and protectors, we include the six disciplines of being a person who is taking refuge, which is called a bodhisattva. And to do that, you have to read this prayer of those six disciplines. So you're combining the top prayer with, the, with this prayer. To the Buddha, the Dharma, and this Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until enlightenment. Now you just combined the top prayer. Now you say, may I through merit gain from practicing the six disciplines accomplish Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. Now you are a Bodhisattva. You have six disciplines. You better know what they are, because you're now you're a Bodhisattva. Sanjay Chodaman Joki Chodaman Jankin Paru Rakhi Chodsuchi Paru Yijin Soki Pe Sarangi Chola Penche Sanjay Yupakso These two prayers predate precede all sutra and tantra practice in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. If you're doing sutra, these two prayers are at the beginning of the sutra. If you're doing tantra, then you start your tantra practice by taking refuge. This distinguishes you as a Tibetan Buddhist, what is called tantrika, or bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is Mahayana, tantrika is Vajra. Tantrika is what? Tantrika is Vajrayana, it means Tantric practice. Mm -hmm. Mahayana is Bodhisattva practice. Mm -hmm. Both of them are, one is an extension of the other. Mm -hmm. So Tantric practice, not only are you a Bodhisattva, but you are a Vajrayana, that means you're using the direct vehicle. And, and that, only very few people can do that. Mahayana, many people can practice. Tantra, Vajrayana, very few. It's kind of like if you want to be a Sherpa and get them out of top, top, out of these very few men qualified. Can I ask a question? What does um, the deities gather in the mandalas? Good question. What is that? Uh, a deity. Yes, where is it? It's in a window, isn't it? Window? Yeah, isn't that a window? It looks like a window. It is a window. 
Well, that's why no, that's an artistic expression of a window. That's the window of your mind. That deity is created in your imagination. That means you, in your mental capabilities, you create a picture. That's right. Yes. And that picture has to come through a window. Yeah. And if you don't have that window open, you can't imagine that picture. See, a lot of people cannot imagine. Children, especially with all of their screens, you know, cell phones, iPhones, TV, television, computers, they have no imagination whatsoever. It's atrophy. Atrophy. Yeah, like if you don't move this finger after a while, it won't move. So atrophy. So then you got, you know, you got to get it back in. <laughs> Mine's the same way. So we show these deities is in a window, in a state of your consciousness that is the picture making mode of your mental fabricating mind, but it's projected inside. That's true. That's true. Then after a while, you learn to project it outside. Oh, mm -hmm. now it's coming through the window. <laughs> and you're it. So the mandala is then this projection inside comes outside. You're the deity, you're the deity, you're the deity. Ringo is the deity. Cockroaches are the deity. The birds in the sky, the, everything is the deity. Oh, Trump becomes the deity. <laughs> Obama. Yeah. They're the deity. Hillary. Hillary. Deity. Absolutely necessary to change this projector, right? <laughs> Bernie. 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 Bernie's the deity. Oh, we already do that. Yeah. yeah already do that. <laughs> but in any case, see, that's what it is. Mandala means we create in our mind a mandala by projecting it. We become it. Now we're on that side. When we become the deity, we're in there. But when we take this deity and put it to everybody else, now it's out it's, here. It's a mandala. It creates a mandala. Becomes a mandala. Uh, it becomes a mandala in your mind when you see everybody in your mind filling space. That's how you create a mandala. You start with mom, then dad, then friends, then relatives, then pets. Then you start to include the whole. Well, your mandala in your mind is starting to get bigger, bigger, and then after a while, there's no room in your mind for it anymore. It starts to come out of here. That's how mandalas work. Very so, powerful. So the pictures in our mind is a mandala? Yes, is the ones we are creating of the deity. Of the deity. Of the deity. It's a mandala of light that has what your, what your refuge says. Altruistic compassion, unconditional love. The deity itself is a state of bliss because there's no emotionality. Is there? You create the deity in mind, are you attached to it? No. Do you hate it? No. Do you feel superior? No. No. See, no emotionality, but you're creating with your mind. You're learning to think without emotionality. Wow. That's what really, really powerful meditators do. But they don't, they're not very compassionate about it. And then they can become magicians, or they can gather immense wealth. Or they could start to control populations. Dangerous. This practice can be dangerous. Then the karma starts to take over. So if the if the activity is self-centered, only for the person, then the karma comes around. Very dangerous. It's got to be altruistic. Got to be applied impartially. That's Tantra. That's the sutra. That's the safeguard. So that if you don't create more pain and suffering, more sickness and disease, more upheaval in the world, more environmental destruction. Are we going to do that? Yeah, but I was going to start with this. Oh. With this prayer. So could you hand these out? This is a practice. 
This practice was actually first designed for the women of the Tara and they come to Maui every year. The Tara dance traditions. So tonight we're going, we've been doing this practice every class using the five elements. But tonight we're going to th throw in a little a little extra into it. We're going to read this together. And the reason we want to read it is so that you you understand that when you actually do it, this is your script. So you're like auditioning yourself. <laughs> you can also keep these if you want. Yeah, this is for keep. You can keep. This is the way we train the pe the girls in the tar dance with this pattern. This was first taught by Carla Rinpoche on Maui in 1977. So we read this. This is the five element meditation, a self-healing practice. It introduces us to the awareness qualities and energies of the five elements directly. It also trains our minds and bodies so we can easily hold the visualization during dance. So I'm going to say during any kind of activity. This was designed for them to dance them. All the <clears throat> all the elemental me meditations are done the same way, with the exception that the chakra they emanate from and return to changes. Refer to your chart for the chakra symbol and corresponding element. Now the chart is. This chart, which was introduced, we all know this chart. So this chart goes with this meditation. Okay? Or you can use these symbols here, like we've been doing in class. Since we are learning the green tar practice, we will use the air element, which dominates jealousy, as an example. Now why we said that is each of these elements corresponds in Tibetan Buddhism to a tara of a certain color with certain quality. So I taught them, to, we, I, taught them to do this practice being tara so they could do the five elements and the mandala practice at the same time while dancing, while creating a mandala of dance. And that they had to choreography, that, that they did on their own. Okay. But for us, all we need to do is follow this script. You begin with the color breathing practice, which is called the three lights. After breathing clear light for a few breaths, keep eyes open and focus your awareness in the heart center. Visualize a small green point of light there, brilliant like a green star in the daylight sky. Slowly expand this point of light to a green sphere about an inch in diameter to the size of a large grain. Place the green seed cell in your heart chakra. Sound the yam, which is the which is called the Sanskrit vibratory sound for air. So do that. Yam. And then if you chant it, you go like this. Yam. And in that way, your speech is helping you to register it in your heart. Then disappear the yuck, the yang, so you're back just to a green sphere in the heart. And that way, the vibratory sound of that sound yang merges with the sphere in your heart. Number two, slowly raise the sphere up the central channel of the body until it reaches the throat chakra. When it is firmly in the throat chakra, change it to a half sphere with the flat side pointing upward. Visualize the half sphere, labeled air, to exit the body from the throat chakra until it's arm length in front of you. Now raise the half sphere till it's level with your eyes. So first you get it out here, then make sure it's in front of your eyes. Still arm's length in front of you. Hold it here for a few moments. Then expand this half sphere of green light until it is large enough for you to sit in. Our sphere of influence is about six feet, so this is a, could be the recommended size. 
See yourself sitting inside this half sphere. Think nothing gets through. Rest for a few moments in this stage and all of the following stages the same way. Expand the sphere of green light until it encompasses the general area you are practicing, including the sky and ocean around it. Now, the reason I said that, our general area is an island, but it could either it could be a town, or it could be just a place in nature, a mountain or whatever. Until it encompasses the whole area where you are practicing, including the sky and ocean, which or an island. Then see the area inside the half sphere. So you enclose the area, then you see everything inside. Number six, expand the half sphere of green light until it encompasses the entire planet Earth and its atmosphere. And you rest. Seven, expand the half sphere of green light until it encompasses our solar system the sun and all the planets inside. Number eight, expand the sphere of green light until it encompasses our spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, inside. Number nine, expand the half sphere of green light until it emerges with the infinite universe without a center or boundaries. Try to encompass the infinite universe inside of the infinite pyramid. This would be the one if you did a fire, a fire one. So, I don't know why that's in there. Relax at this stage into auspicious, into spaciousness beyond concept. So when you move to, be, to space itself with the half sphere, it'll disappear because you can't conceptualize space and you just relax in that space. So there's no projection, there's no, it, mind doesn't need to do anything, so you just relax. It says, just let it be without judging it. When you've been to feel agitated, you turn to the half sphere around the galaxy. So again, out of space, which is your non-conceptual state of your mind, which is actually the reason you can't find a mind, because it's like space. Shrink the half sphere of green light until it encompasses the galaxy, then shrink it until it encompasses the solar system. Eleven, shrink the half sphere until it encompasses planet Earth. Twelve, you shrink the half sphere until it encompasses your town or island. Shrink the half sphere of green light until you just you sitting inside of it. Shrink the half sphere of green light until it's back to a one inch half sphere in front of your eyes. This is the stage that should be held the longest. The reason for that is, is because now you're starting to identify what is in front of your eyes is inseparable from what is your imagining. Just like you did with the space thing. That was my instruction to the tar dancers. In the same way when you went out to infinity and back, you, in fact, gather the air element's energy, which is enriching your own energy. You may feel the power of this with, in time, that means with practice. Lower the half sphere back down into the throat chakra level in your body and feel it lock into place there. Then the half sphere of light slowly back down into the heart chakra in the central channel. Then you shrink, shrink the sphere until the green light down to a point of green light. You can do this in stages or all at once. Once it reaches this tiny microcosm, you again relax. This means you again disappear into the sky of your mind. 
Now, this kind of meditation gets to the used to the idea that you can't find self. Because the nature of your mind is like the nature of the sky. And the sky doesn't have any limit. It doesn't have a center. How can you say you exist in the center? If you go into your mind, you, you will start to find that the space exists through your actual thoughts. Your, your thoughts are like time. They're arising sequentially. And after a while, the thought process will get slower and slower and slower, and you'll start to see the space between this thought and the next thought. And the next. <laughs> after a while, you'll just see the space. There's no hide there. And realization starts to Wow. What am I? Am I the thoughts or am I the space between the thoughts? Neither. Both. Neither. <laughs> or both. But then you start to think it is and it is not about everything. Now you're now you're starting to become realized. If you say what's in front of your eye exists, you can't find anything there. But you cannot say it does not exist either because there's air in there. There's energy there, isn't there? That's exactly the same as your mind. You will realize it. I can't do this for you. I agree, no? Number 15. Relax in this state by putting down a heavy burden at the end of a long journey. Do not move. That means sit as still as you can. Place the mind at rest within this stillness. Whatever arises, just watch. Remain aware and relax. When you begin to feel agitated, return your awareness into the room or place of practice. Substitute the symbol of one of the other four elements and repeat the practice using that symbol. So this step-by-step -step sheet that we just made up, which will work to make it read better, if I took the earth element and put it in place of the air element, it would start the same way. And then if you want, you can sound long when it's in the earth. But actually, the earth element works the best down here. This is where all your earth gets transformed. What you eat is the earth element. And this is, this element actually Starts here and then comes to here. I didn't put that in the tap. Then, if you use this element, starts in the heart chakra. What's your body control system? Your body is made of water. What controls the body? The brain. So you put this one up here. Then out here. Then in front of your eye. Then do the practice. If it's the fire element, where's the fire in your body? Here. That chart, isn't it? Yeah. Light. It starts here, goes down to here, then out, then up before your eye. Space element, here, leave it here. This is what we're developing. The heart, mind, and the Buddha, what he's like. And these seats elements, you can use or not use on this chart, this side. Then in the Tara dance, they actually became the Tara. So if they were the red Tara, they used the element wrong in that meditation, and they visualized themselves as a red deity. See the Tara down the bottom here? Those two deities are Tara. Those are space Tara. But if they were red, then they'd be fire Tara. If they were gold, then they'd be earth tars. If they were green, they'd be air tars. Mm -hmm. What is Tara? Tara is a method of visualizing your body in its true nature. Scientists agree with this one. Your body is made of atoms. 
water atom. They're the nature of everything in the universe. They're the middle between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Everything in the universe is gathered this way. So all the matrix of the universe is actually spaced with light and the light is the atom. Then the atom gathers into what is called matter. Matter takes up a large part of space. That's where we see planets, solar systems, galaxies, sun, so forth. Our own body. This is matter. And to us, it really matters. <laughs> so we're, we're really only a collection of matter. Consciously collected because of karma into this production, which is always changing. So the body you have this week will not be the body you have next week. Next. Won't be. This body this week will not be the body next week. Because all your cells, if you're made of atoms, are constantly changing, recycling. All the surface of the body, they're leaving. All the cells are leaving. Your hair, cells leaving. Your fingernails, cells leaving. Your poop, cells leaving. Spit, sweat, cells leaving. Earwax, so, so this process is ongoing. So the body that you have now will be an entirely new set of atoms. So every seven years, completely recycled. So scientists, are, they got a pretty good handle. Some truth in what they do. So I made up this practice so you can take it. And we're going to. Yeah. Back. We usually do the the light coming up, going straight out from the hot chakra. And when you throw it up to the stone chakra, you want to take it out in front, but you want to also make sure that it's in front of your eyes, because when this chakra comes out, you're going to have to bring it up. When this chakra comes out, you're going to bring it down. But always make sure that the symbol is here, in front of your eyes, two feet out. Why? Because this energy here is the element. This is all the elements right here in front of you. Air possesses all five elements. You can't have air without water, dust, there's yes, just earth. It could be here too. Well, if you bring it out here, you got to bring it back down in front of your eyes. Oh, your eyes are looking like oh, this. Now, after a while, if you practice, you start to understand that clear nature is like the sky, then your eyes will look like this. You bring them up, directly in front, like you're looking somebody in the eye. But right here, then your eyes go like this. Instead of soft, you go hard game. <laughs> and you'll see a lot of pictures of practitioners like this. And they don't blink either. That's called the non-emergent practice. That's pretty intense. I don't recommend it. So any questions about this? This is just kind of a guide. But what you're training here is two things. Your ability to follow the script, which means you have to focus. Like when you go sailing, you got a script. You got to follow the script or you're going to be in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Just like that, this is it. But this script, you, you, that's your increasing your power and attention span. You can go through this whole practice without being drawn off to some something else. But more importantly, you're using the symbol to enhance your imaginary power so that you can come out of the clarity with that power to here. And where is here? This is in the middle of the drama field. <laughs> of course the drama is in your mind too, but this is where the drama field is. Your every exhale goes to everybody in the drama field. And then you're breathing their drama. 
And this is very powerful practice. That's why Carl Rinpoche started this retreat. Next practice. Shall we do one of these? Or is that just read the script? Okay, we do one. Let's do space. Space is easy because there's nothing to visualize. It's a sphere. White sphere. Okay, so we'll start. Bring your mind to a point in the center of your heart chakra. In other words, create a point of light. And expand it slowly till it shows itself as a sphere. Doesn't have to be any color, so it's clear sphere. And expand it to a sphere of this size. White in color, label it space. Bring the sphere directly out in front and to where your gaze is. So make sure it's in that place in front of your eye. Just like this. Then expand it to completely enclose your body. So now you're floating or sitting inside this sphere of white light. Labeled space. Then we expand it to completely enclose this island and the ocean, surrounding ocean, air, inside. Then we expand it in size to enclose Mother Earth and her atmosphere, which is actually the situation. Expanding the space symbol, we enclose the solar system. And we visualize the sun and all the planets inside. Expand it with your imagination to completely enclose our spiral dish-shaped galaxy. And the final step is to expand it to the proportions of boundless space. Space exists without a boundary or a center. So relax at this point. Relax your imagination. Just be present. Then again, with the light of space, create the concept of this sphere enclosing our galaxy. Shrink it to just enclosing our solar system. Smaller and smaller to just enclose Mother Earth. In our town or island where we live, inside. Then again, to enclose your body. Bringing all the life force of this element to register in the body. Then bring it back in front of your eyes.
and imagine it coming into your heart center, the center of your chest. Shrink it to a tiny sphere and tinier until it reaches the size of a particle similar to an atom. And relax as that merges with the light of space. At this point, no meditation. When you start to become dull or agitated, bring your awareness into the place of practice to take a break. Practice and meditation and break from meditation are necessary. After a while, there won't be any break. Like going to the gym. Well, you never leave the gym. <laughs> Any questions? This is really a good training for any practice of Tibetan Buddhism. You see, when you do this, this is an artist's concept. And it's again a window. See? So this is the window, this is in your mind. But if this window not only includes one aspect of your consciousness, your support system of beings who are already there all the time, but it's also the beings who are not there, ever, which is the whole world. So you're, you're making this in your mind, then your body and your speech and your mind will come together because you're saying, I'm taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Lama, deities, and protector. And they're all on this tree, like a bunch of crow. In order to bring all beings, my mothers, to maturity, we use the word Buddha, Buddha to maturity. That's it. But you're laying down and standing up, so the energy of what you're imagining and what you're saying is going into atoms of your body. That's extraordinary. And after you do this a few thousand times, you can feel it. And one day you're going to lay down and stand up and you're going to think you dived into nowhere anywhere. You'll enter into a sphere of space, which is a state of clear light. Light and space is the nature of energy. All energy, so is too. Always changing, of course, as it creates matter. But light and space cannot be separated. That is the nature of your consciousness also. After a while, you'll start to know that inside and outside, no difference. Then no dualistic fixation. There won't be an I meditating and a meditating, object of meditation. When you dive into space and you know that you are space, then you know that you are everything. That's the simplicity of the mind. And you wonder, why didn't I do that before? Nature gives you the whole program. That's the nature of everything that goes on. But this is a trick, and it was invented 2,600 years ago. Now, a lot of the lamas do prostrations. They don't know why they do. I mean, not lamas, monks. A lot of nuns, because they haven't been taught that the discipline of the prostration is to be coordinated with the refuge and an object of the refuge, which could be a Buddha, it could be a Bodhisattva, 
It could be the teacher. It could be any one of the things represented in this picture or all of that. So we have two classes of Buddhism on the planet. Religious Buddhism and Tantra. Most Buddhists are religious. Fine. Didn't you say that Tibetan Buddhism is, is not a religion? Cannot be a religion. So how can they be religious? Because Buddhists, the other Buddhists believe the Buddha to be a god and when they created this god, the church would be answered. And if they follow what that god says, they'll go to Buddha heaven. So Doesn't that sound like religion? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but are you saying that the Buddhist that you belong, the Buddhism that you belong to is not that Buddhism? Entirely not that. In fact, we vow never to go to heaven and never worship anything. That's part of our vow, as Bodhisattva. So if I vow never to go to heaven, where am I going? Well, in any religious mind, I'm going to hell. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they got those. Supernatural and the opposite. Never, we don't do that. I vow never to go to heaven. Ever, 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 ever. But isn't heaven now? Oh, you're getting close. <laughs> See, now you're starting to move to the nature of the mind. Now. Mm -hmm. The instant present is the nature of the mind. When you're in nature, you got to be connected to the present or nature will kill you. You got to be in the moment. You got to know what's going on right now, because everything around you can take your life. That's part of the survival training of all the tribes of the planet up until this industrial age. Threw all that out the window. I know this from having immersed myself in nature with the tradition of survival, and that's how I could navigate the world. It's like. You got to be fully present, mind, nature, you and me. <laughs> we're we're going to have some fun together. No fear. You can't have fear. Put the fear and worry out. It's just an obstacle. Muddy the water. Relax. If you're going to climb up a cliff and dive off, relax while you're climbing up the cliff. The fun is when you're airborne. Well, how about when you land? <laughs> it's only water. You hope? <laughs> no, hope is fear. Hope is based on fear. You already checked. <laughs> right? You don't go diving off these waterfalls around here until you check the pool, man. Sure. Next practice. If we take one of these elements and make it into the tar, then we are doing the window thing. We're coming out of the clear nature of our mind to present an example of what we take refuge in. Now the refuge, to identify the refuge this way is to think of the mother's relationship to the child. So who's the mother? You are. Who's the child? Everybody else. That's Tara. Okay. So you're you're applying altruistic compassion with unconditional love. So this is coming from the heart to everybody, whether you like them or not. <laughs> to start with, because you know we've got this. I like you. I don't like you. Fixation. And I don't care about the rest of it. Hardly. So when you start with this practice, you put the sound of the vibratory energy of space and the elements in the heart chakra, and that's the tongue, the five or the dotted. So you create that in your heart center. Then you connect to all these 
Lama is deities and protector. The light comes back into the tom and you become Tara. Now what is Tara? Tara is an imaginary symbol of a perfect mother, a perfect female bodhisattva, which embodies everything that you said here and here. So the Tara is all the Lamas, all the deities, all the protectors, all the Buddhas, all the teaching, and everybody that practices. That's the Tara. What is she doing? She's a Bodhisattva. She's kind and considerate, generous, patient, virtuous, which means not harmful, diligent, enthusiastic, I'll throw that in there, and focused. Meditating focus. Because you need to hold this image as who you are without having a body disturbing you. The time in your heart center, you're this Tara, 3D, beautiful, young, healthy, whatever. And then you project that to the woman who gave you this body. You don't need to know who she was. Even if she threw you in a dumpster, which women do. So this Tara, this Tara, same. Then mom, dad, friends, relatives, brothers, enemies, dad. Keep extending this range of this imaginary. That's the word for it. It means a creation of light in the mind. Okay, so sit with your back straight. Start with a point of light in the center of your heart. Think that this point of light is in a channel of energy called life force that runs like a tube down through the center of your body, from your head to your bottom of your torso. Expand that point of light to a sphere and from the sphere to a five colored sphere about this size Made of five colors of light so it's shimmering with these five colors. This is a cone And you send light from the tom inside that out to all the lamas And all the deity symbols As if they're around you in space which they are then the light is returned into the tom and you manifest as a hologram, an illusory body of the tar. Young, beautiful, smiling, greenish aura, dressed with five colors of silks, six kinds of jewelry, head adorned with a five jewel crown, Sitting with your right leg extended like this, like this statue here, this one. Then you project this as replacing your physical body. So now you're a light hologram, symbol. Then once you have this and you can see yourself this way, project it to your mother and then all your people you have karma with, all your family, friends, yeah, all the ones you like, all the ones you don't like, and the rest of the human race which you don't even care about. And project it to all the animals in the ocean and on the land. So now inside your mind the mandala is growing outward in the same way you did the five elements meditation. So it starts immediately around you, then it fills the island, then it fills the planet, then it fills the solar system, then it fills the galaxy, then it fills space. Once it fills space, the heart sound of this vibratory energy appears as ten syllables. They appear in the heart center, but they come out your exhale, your speech. 
So you sound this creation of this mandala. Om Tar to Tare to Re So Ha. 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 If you're counting this mantra for practice, then you use a mala for a counter, 108 beads. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re So Ha. 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 Now that Tara mantra is not stationary. Those ten letters are circling the tongue are moving counterclockwise. And they are giving off radiant psychic energy which fills your body. It shoots out into space. What is your body, Tara? So you think like that. The Tom and the ten syllables of the mantra in here flashing thousands and thousands of channels of energy, light through your body, out to space. As what? Psychic healing energy. What is the tom? The tom is all five elements in one sound, similar to the elemental practice. So that blazing energy is running up and down through the central channel of your life force and then spreading out through your body. Actually 72,000 channels of energy circulating through your body. Think that. Imagine this. And when I pick this up, this is the five elements but also the five wisdoms inside, your inherent awareness. This is the five wisdoms to the vibratory sound of the universe. That's what this represents. This is the male aspect of method. This is the female aspect of motivation. These two inseparable.
This sea song, this mantra in you as Tara creates the mandala of all beings being the same thing. So wherever how you visualize yourself, they're equal to that. If your energy is penetrating through your body, same for them. If the energy is being, we call, emanated outward, they're doing the same thing. Om Dara Tu Dara Tu Rei Soha 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 Om Dara Tu Dara Tu From your heart, this vibratory sound. So um, to all the children, all the human children, all the animal children, all the spirit children. In your mind, everyone is tired, feels faith. In the outer world, same. No difference inside, outside, same. People. 
After a while, the mantra starts to be everything. After a while, the mind becomes everyone. Yes. Slowly. Stay focused. Imagine. Inside. Outside. Inside. Outside. Then, after a while, this gets no separation inside, outside, same. Tom, vibratory sound of union. You is your illusory body, which is the nature of everything. All beings equal. If they're all equal, there's no pain and suffering. And at the end of this recitation of the mantra and visualizing the mandala of the Tara, then you collect all sentient beings into you as Tara. So you just see every being in the universe into you. And you in the sky of your mind disappear into the sound of the heart mantra. Then the ten syllables disappear into the tom. And the tom and sphere of five colored light shrink to a tiny point into space. Relax. No meditation. No effort required to be in space. Past is gone, future isn't here, present hard to find. In space there's no drama, no judgment. And when you come out of this state of relaxed awareness in the present timeless moment, again project yourself as Tara and all beings as Tara for your post-meditational practice after you go back into the drama field. Adjust all sound to the sound of the mantra. Om Tara, Tu Tara, Tu Re Soha. The clear nature of space is that sea salt of tongue. That's the five elements in one sound. If you have green tar, you have the air element. If you have white tar, you have the space element. If you all beings in your mandala are red tar, you have the fire, the radiation element. If you have blue tar, water. If you have gold tar, Earth, your choice, same mantra. Any questions? You're the artist. 
Paint the picture however you want. Artistic license is okay. You have an imagination. How do you think they came up with this? This is the Kagyu refuge tree. The other lineages don't do that. The Nyingmapas use a bell. Then all the Lama and all the beings down there. So every lineage has this. We use a tree. Because the tree is what you go under when it starts to rain or too much sun to get the shade. The tree is the nature of life on this planet. What a refuge. Yeah, so we. Kagyu lineage. This Kagyu. This Shangpa Kagyu. Shangpa Kagyu is a mixture of the old Tibetan tradition of shamanism with the new Tibetan tradition of compassion and impartially applied loving kindness. That's the new tradition. So they blended both. And because the Buddha took refuge under a tree for many years to attain liberation from the drama field, they decided to use a tree. And also in Tibet, there isn't many trees. Tibet's a desert. Mongolia is a desert. Very austere. So, all the bodhisattvas, all the special lineage practices, all the Buddhas, that means people who need to reach maturity, all of the Lamas, we have 12 lineages. So that's a lot, of, a lot of teachers. All the Lamas, lineage masters are alive on the planet today. Four of them are women. And that's just the Kagyu tradition. You have the Nyingma tradition. You have the Dalai Lama, Gigluka tradition. You have the Sakya tradition, which is northern Tibet, Mongolia. You have the, now we have the Kadampa tradition. Those masters were killed by the Chinese, but now they've reincarnated. So they're started again. So these various lineages, powerful, all of them have been tricked. And a woman with tricks, wow, there's some really tricky women. There's one up in Vancouver, Canada, there's one up in Toronto, Canada, there's another one in Scottsdale, Arizona, there's another one in Colorado. Yeah, very powerful. Where's that? I mean, who's there in Sutton? They're all Kagyu. Yeah. Name office, they have many women. Women teachers. So then you just lay that down, put it on the wall, whatever. Then I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Lama, Deity, and Protecting. So I'm taking the energy of that into my body, speech, and mind. And myself, I visualize all sentient beings diving into space. And coming back up. And finish. So you recognize a lot of this, what's going on is Hatha Yoga postures, right? This is a very powerful practice. If you do the prostrations, you don't have to go to the gym. Mama <laughs> <laughs> Rinchen, 84 years old. I do prostrations. 180 does every day. 84 years old. No matter where he is. One time he asked an airline story so we could do it on the plane. Really? Yeah, she would say, go to the back. <laughs> In the aisle? <laughs> to the back of the plane. He says, what are you going to do? Says, I'm going to lay down and stand up. She says, why? It's my regimen. She says, yeah, go to the back of the plane, do it. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> He's a character. Thank you for a nice class tonight. Yes. Oh yeah, dedication. You can think when you're dedicating that all beings are dedicating this with you. When you say Mahamudra, that's your clear nature. 
When you say three bodies, that's your body, speech, and mind. And when you say the unchanging truth of Dharma, that's your clear light. That's your no drama mind. By this virtue, having realized Mahamudra, and he had quickly established all beings without an exception. In this state, through the blessings of the three bodies of the Buddha, the three bodies, obtained the three bodies through the blessing of the unchanging truth of the Dharma, to the blessing of the unwavering aspirations of the Sangha. May this and all dedication bears be fulfilled. May all be, be happy for your suffering, establishing a list of our practice and becoming emotionally stable. Kewa di nirdu dhamma, chagya tempo drugya nene, drowa chinki malu dhamma, dehi sala kupasa, sangye kusho nempai jenwa dhamma, joni nebhur nempai jenwa dhamma, and in Hawaii we say mahalo. Mahalo. Did you say? Mahalo. Did you say? Mahalo. Lama